an overlooked time-honored tradition that is being spoiled, potential Pac-12 road traps, and a hex that should come to a close, maybe, but you never know. This is the College Game Day podcast for Wednesday, September 21st. Reese Davis and Pete Thamel here. So, Pete, there there are many places that we could start, but I think the first place we need to start is a text that you sent to the ESPN pod crew last night, uh, giving us the warning from the Food and Drug Administration not to cook chicken in NyQuil. Pete, I've got a question for you. Why did you send that text to us? (laughs) <laughs> because I thought that sort of uh, hit our Southern fried sensibilities, except it was uh, instead of chicken fried, it was NyQuil fried. Uh, I just thought you, it I, was like a, a bizarre like twist of America. And the one thing about college football, it is woven through some bizarre twists in America. And it sort of was like the cousin of the other story I sent to the pod text, which was the... Uh, the CEO or COO of the fake burger company um, getting, was it to get arrested at Arkansas? Yeah. This week? yeah he, he bit a guy's nose. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, you know why? I mean, uh, who, no. who, who could blame him? I mean, he's been eating that fake meat stuff that should be, you know, um, I, I don't think this is going to upset my son. My son had business class. He got his MBA at Duke, uh, brag while he's out while he's playing baseball so one of these fake meat companies and my son is is devoutly fake uh, anti-fake meat and they asked him for a business plan and he said that he would if he were the ceo that he would try to align with elon musk get one of his rockets take all of their product and launch it into the sun <laughs> that, that would that would be what you should do with the fake meat products and clearly this gentleman was hungry for uh, you know, he, he was addled. He was out of his mind. And, and when he should just be going and getting a nice uh, a nice porterhouse or a nice ribeye or filet or something, he instead bit some guy's nose. And it was all because it was all because the guy's Subaru bumped his Bronco. Did you see that part of it? I did not see that yeah, part of how it. How about that? I did not see that part of it. But this podcast could just be renamed. I am Reese Davis and I raised a carnivore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm in favor of uh, carnivorous offerings at the table for sure. While while we're on this subject, because we're gonna have Dan Mullen join us in a little bit, and Dan's got a sharp wit, as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're gonna dive into the games. The I wonder great- how like sharp wit the Tennessee fans have had with Dan over the years. Um, oh, that's- yeah. Well, <laughs> his 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 wit his wit with Tennessee has come in the form of victories for the most part. As that is just- for for the total part. Even yeah, just undefeated a, against the Vols. Just but so so is every other Florida coach in the last 17 years, with exception yeah. of one. They've they've lost 16 of 17. It's amazing to Tennessee. There, how about this? This is a breakthrough moment for Tennessee. Oh yeah, because they've lost 16 of 17 to Florida. They're 0 for Saban, and yeah. they and they've lost. I I counted up. They've lost 10 of 12 to Georgia. So I. So I think they have lost, if my math is right, it looks like they have lost 41 of their last 44 ri- big rivalry games. Now, I know Kentucky views itself as a rival to Tennessee, and they are. Nah. But in the, yeah, in the eyes of Tennessee fans, yeah. that's, a, that's a tear down. You know, so that, that's, I don't mean that to, you know, Kentucky's probably had the, well, not probably, Kentucky has had the better program the last few years. I'm speaking no in an in historical context. Tennessee doesn't look at that as their biggest rival. They certainly don't look at Vanderbilt that way. So in the three games that matter the most, the Tennessee fans, they've lost 41 of 44. No wonder they get mad and throw golf balls at their former coach when he shows up. That's frustrating. <laughs> not Where did they throw the mustard game, bottle? The Was that baseball? Didn't they throw a mustard bottle? Yeah, there, there's all kinds of stuff going on yeah. in the baseball program. The NCAA changed rules mostly because of them and, and some of the things they did. They throw bats toward people's dugouts. I'm all for baseball guys having a good time, but they, they kind of go overboard there. But that's a different different topic for a different podcast. Um, I, think that, I think that Tennessee, though, turns the corner Saturday. And then the question becomes not, I don't want to give away the picks and also wouldn't jinx them because probably I'd do better if I made my picks on NyQuil chicken and I owe you a dollar because that was your line before the pod started. 
But Tennessee really fans should be petrified, by the way. It's only Wednesday, and you've yeah. already just jinxed them. Man, it's been rough. But I, I golf falls think, at you if you pick them. <laughs> I know, this, uh, yeah, this, this should be the moment, Pete, that they turn the corner. They win a game like this against a team they should beat, frankly. And then, then the evaluation becomes they get, they get Bama at home. I don't recall. I think the, where is the Georgia, the Georgia game's in Athens, I think. So that's, that's going to be an L probably. But then the evaluation comes of whether they can challenge for the SEC because it's a one shot deal, man. I mean, you know, you go, you go to Georgia, they go there on November 5th. And, you know, if you've beaten Florida and maybe you clip Alabama, you know, you, you got a shot, you got a shot here and you're competing for a championship and you've elevated the entire program. Don't forget about that trip to Baton Rouge now. I know. I mean, yeah, look, I just I know. Like, I know LSU, they played, they played really well. They, they played well yeah, against Mississippi state. Yeah. They look good the other night. I agree. Yeah. I don't think Mississippi state scored in the second half. And I, you know, Brian Kelly knows what he's doing. Like it's uh, Brian Kelly in a one score game. Usually pretty, you know, pretty mm-hmm. good results. So I just think like historically that is one of the harder places to, uh, to, to go play. It is to be determined, but that I don't I haven't looked at the schedule out that far, but that smacks of like one of those eight o'clock starts, nine o'clock starts. Um, and uh, you will see how fast that offense goes amid the din. But, you know, it's um, now you're saying one of the hardest places to play. And it has been for the last, say, 22 years, you know, when since Nick Saban got there mm-hmm. prior to that. That was, uh, as they say in, ta- in Texas, that was all hat and no cattle. It was the most overrated home field advantage in college football. I say it's changed that. And it is a tough place to play, and it's loud. But you know the thing about the thing about LSU and playing there, it is an electric atmosphere. It's one of my favorite places. But the the cool thing about being a visiting team at LSU is if you go in as a visitor and you play well, and you really get the game going in your favor, you can make that crowd turn on their own team faster than any other crowd in college football. So sometimes you can use that energy uh, in your favor. I saw that last year in the Auburn game. I happened to be there when uh, sort of the, the the great unwinding of Ed Orgeron began. The Boobirds were out quick. It was, you know, it, I believe it was a 6 o'clock kick uh central and so you know there were people having a good old time all day as they as they do at lsu i mean we, we can save our off-season tailgate rankings for uh for for some time <laughs> in april when things are slow but oh boy they get after it at lsu and uh yeah by the by the end the energy that had been sort of channeled was uh to orgeron to the play calling to the uh <laughs> haphazard burning of timeouts um you know, all those, uh, all those things they don't miss in uh, Baton Rouge right now. Going to give you 17 million. When do you want me to leave? And which door do you want me to use? <laughs> that was a great line <laughs> that Ed had the other day <laughs> uh, about that. We're going to talk more about Florida and Tennessee coming up. couple of Pac-12 road traps this weekend, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, USC goes to Oregon State. Oregon goes to the Palouse. Which of those games are you more compelled by, more fascinated by? I will, I will tell you that as good as SC looks, their turnover margin going in their favor, I think it's 10 nothing now in their favor. Going into Corvallis against a, a good team, I think adversity hits USC this weekend. I'm, I'm not going to decide until the Friday pod who I'm actually picking to win. But I think this is their first sign of trouble, and, and it's going to be really fascinating to see how they how they respond to it. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? Isn't that what Mike Tyson said? Mm-hmm. Well, the, the Trojans haven't been punched in the mouth yet. They're about to get punched in the mouth um, on, uh, on, on Saturday night in Corvallis. So two of the better settings in college football for weird things to happen, right? So when you exactly. think about when you think of now, if, if this was like October, November, it might be a, a little more, a little better. But when you think about the the famous Thursday fog game uh, at Oregon State, you think about the Palouse, like there's been games where you can't even see the darn football on TV because because uh, of that. So they're, they're, one of the great things about college football is you've got uh, we'll have 100,000 roaring on Saturday in Knoxville. And those are two little band boxes, but doesn't mean their fans don't care. It doesn't mean it's not going to be loud because 
you get the right 30,000 seat stadium. You remember from the game day you did in Pullman Reese, uh, mm-hmm. you can, you can go just as uh, it, it can be just as hard. So I am, uh, I am looking forward to both those. I am putting both those teams on upset alert as well. Uh, one thing to watch for Oregon state is that their uh, all world tight end. Who's really an underrated NFL prospect. Luke, Mus- Luke Musgrave missed the Montana state game. So his status, and we can talk about this more in the picks pod, his status is up in the air this week, which he's the best player on their offense. So that's just something to tuck in the back of your mind for those of whom will be watching that game from an investment perspective. Um, uh, are I, you look, are you hinting that you think he's going to be out, or do you suspect that they were making sure he was good for SC? His status is unknown. Okay, so they they have not declared him back. You know, sometimes when you play an FCS team um, there, so his, that status is up in the air right now. So I just think that's an important note when you're when you're dialing into the uh, to the personnel of, of of these two games that you know that that could be something. Now, I want to say that. Chance Nolan ran up 42 in the Coliseum last year. Does that ring a bell? Mm-hmm. It was, yep. it was a, it was, it was a sight to watch Oregon state just sashay through the Coliseum. I mean, that is something that like I had not seen and maybe, maybe they did it. Maybe they did it with Dennis Erickson and TJ Hushmanzada and those guys, but for them to roll in there and not only win, but win the way they did, I think was, was really impressive. If Oregon state is going to win on, on Saturday, Reese, they are really going to have to control the ball, right? They are not going to, they just, they just, you know, they sprint car raced them in the Coliseum last year. And that is not the recipe to win. The recipe to win is going to be takeaway. And when you, when you look at Oregon state statistically, they are the archetype of a team that is squeezing the most out of their talent. They are number one in the country in red zone offense at 1,000%. They are number nine in the country in turnover margin. And they are number 16 in the country, fourth down percentage. So what does that tell you? That tells you that they have kept the ball. And that tells you they have treasured it like a precious diamond. And when they do get in the red zone, they score every single time. So that's a credit to the play calling. That's a credit to, uh, you know, Really good coaching. Now they they boot stomped Boise. I mean that was that was not really a game. Boise scored no. a little bit in the second half. They outlasted Fresno with every bit of Vegas luck I've never had. Right with that with that with the with the the what's the onions to to make that uh to make that last second play call to uh to to go win the game and then they ran they ran sixty eight on Montana State. So, um. Yeah, they have a, a pretty pretty spicy gauntlet here coming up with SC at home at Utah and at Stanford. So um, if they can figure out a way to come, they will, you know, they should be ranked, I think, you know, for I, the. I, yeah. Yeah. Have you ranked I, them, Reese? I did. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've had I had them ranked last week, them and Washington State, um, because. My thing on where I place them, and you know, look, you you wish you could rank these teams in rows instead of columns. I've talked about that before. Uh, if memory serves, I think I put Wazoo a spot ahead of them simply because Wazoo has the road win. Sure. Wisconsin sort of rewarding that. I think Oregon State's better uh, just from from watching the two teams. The turnover, the turnover thing you mentioned, and by the, it was they put forty five on them last year and put 45, over five okay. five and over five hundred yards of offense, over three hundred on the ground. The turnover thing that you mentioned with Oregon State, they've gained eight turnovers. They're plus five. You mentioned where they rank. SC has been even better. They're they're ten zero. They're plus ten Woo! in three games. They've gained ten and haven't given up one yet. So it they're. Oregon State has turned the ball over. They've lost three. Can't do that to SC because the offense is going to score. So your formula, I agree with 1,000%. Keep the ball, run it. Hopefully Musgrave's ready. Use the tight end. Move the ball down the field and put a little uh, anxiety on the USC offense to feel like they have to score because they don't know when they're getting it back. And we've also seen Lincoln's teams – as great as he is, they've gone into some road environments not dissimilar from the one that they will see in Corvallis uh, this week, Manhattan, Ames, and sometimes they've kicked it around a little bit, you know? So I, I really think this is a uh, – I've been really impressed with SC. I moved them into the top four this week, 
And I think their defense is not quite as bad as we thought uh, at times, but they're leaky, you know, so so they'll give up some plays. But if you give them extra possessions, you're done, done, because they're too potent on offense and they're going to put up, they're going to put up some points. Oregon State will have to control the ball and they'll still have to score in the 30s or they won't win, I don't think. Do you, you agree with that? I, I agree with that. And I think this is a strength coach game. If Oregon State wins, they should carry their strength coach off the field because they will have dominated USC between the tackles. And that is the place where we really don't have the answers yet on USC. As mm-hmm. you, you call that Stanford game, you know, there was there was no definitive upfront point of attack domination from the Trojans in that correct. game, correct? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I can't sit here and tell you I know a ton about Oregon State's right guard and who they are, but they are they are a tough and nasty program. That's their identity. That's what Jonathan Smith has brought there. There's continuity. There's veterans. And they are going to, you know, this is their moment. This is the big single biggest day of the year on the calendar in Corvallis, Oregon. And if they can, you know, control the ball and control that line of scrimmage and not turn the ball over, it's going to be a game. And uh, I'm I'm excited. It's it's a small spread, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a six and a half. Last time yeah. I looked, I mean, which is you know I I would have I would have expected it to be a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, on our college game day planning call this week, Bear asked us what we thought the spread would be, and I, I remember saying I'd already peaked and looked, so I knew. But I agreed with him that I would have expected, based on what SC has done, it to be a little bit bigger. So it shows the our comrades in arid regions who pay close attention to such <laughs> things recognize the same warning signs that we do, whether it's a, whether it's the road trip, whether it's the turnover luck that can't last, which I'm sure Bill Connolly is going to address when he joins us on Friday in our picks, because that's a big thing in Bill's SP plus is your mm-hmm. turnover luck. But the one thing I have noticed, sometimes it lasts an entire season, but then it's yes. the next year that, that yes. you can't, that you can't buy one. So that, that'll be fascinating. But, man, uh, offensively, it has clicked really, really fast. I and mean, I think five of Caleb's eight, t- Caleb Williams, we talk about these people like, you know, everybody's sitting in the room and we're addressing everybody by their first name. I think five of uh, Caleb Williams' touchdown passes have gone to Jordan Addison already, which you would expect that from a Bolitnikoff winner, but they've they've meshed very quickly. What do you make of the other Pac-12 road trip? Uh, Oregon now, we we – are reconfiguring our belief system in Oregon after they beat BYU, knocking knocking a wheel off of one of our bandwagons. We we decided Oregon was a long way off and that Bo Nix was no different after watching Georgia. Then we watched Georgia look as if they're playing in a different league from everybody else. They even look a step above uh, Ohio State and Alabama, in my judgment right now. Uh, not not a wide chasm, but you know there's there's separation at least in the way those teams have played uh, in, in my estimation up to this point. So now we've decided, okay, maybe Oregon, maybe Oregon's not so bad. Oregon came in and just, you know, smacked BYU in the face with a frying pan. And it was, you know, it was over pretty fast. Now they go to the Palouse feeling good about themselves. Washington state's been getting better. I don't think Cameron Ward has put up the numbers that we thought maybe he would initially he might come in throwing it around, but it seems like he's improved week to week. However, he has been sacked nine times and he's thrown three interceptions. So is this, is this one of those things where we're putting too much stock in Washington state having won at Wisconsin and maybe Oregon is significantly better? I think Oregon is better. I just wonder how uh, Washington State's going to score because their their offense has been, I would say, pedestrian, but that might be overly complimentary to uh, to, to how they've been. They scored twenty four against Idaho. They obviously uh, out Wisconsin, Wisconsin, in in some ways, uh, in in scoring seventeen, and then they had thirty eight against a bad Colorado State team. Colorado State's bad this year. They're, that's uh, the, early the entire state evidence. of Colorado yes. is uh, is ungood. Not Air Force though. Well, that you're right. Fair point. Fair point. Yes. Yes. I'm not, I've, but the bandwagon's broken on a country road in Boone, but I'm not abandoning yet. All right. <laughs> I'm not abandoning our, uh, our, our running fullback, uh, 
it's it's early but, it's early enough yeah. to get the thing up on blocks, put the tire back yeah. on, and have it yeah. have it cruise good, on down the highway. Get a good. I bet I bet the pit crew there in Boone would look a lot like Yosef, the mascot. So, <laughs> uh, so I just I would just if if there's going to be a recipe for an upset, I would just want a little more spark out of the Washington State offense. Now, what what is that little band box on the Palouse hold? Thirty thousand. A little bit more than that. I think yeah. it's uh, yeah. I yeah, can't mid-30s. remember the exact. Yeah, the exact number here. I'll, I'll get it for you. I think it's uh, I, I want to say it's in the high 30s, but I, I could be yes. wrong about that. Yeah. Now they have had an elite defense um, and it will be interesting. Oregon comes in scorching on offense after uh, after getting ragged all down there in Atlanta. And can Washington State find some way to make a resistance and create adversity? BYU did not create any adversity for Oregon. Um that was a, a drama-free, generally stress-free game for the Ducks. And the power of the road uh, and being a home underdog like Washington State is, is that you can you can manufacture some adversity and let pucker power move in. So I have a little more faith in the Beavers than the Ducks on the road. Uh, the, I'm sorry. Sorry about that, Taylor. Three, two, one. I have a little more faith in the Beavers than the Cougars in uh, in being a super dog this weekend. You you've just stumbled onto one of our uh, something that we should do, Taylor. Put this in your notebook, and we're going to start using it. Pucker power. Mm, I'm a big pucker power guy. Pucker power. College Man, hoops too. It, you know what? That's that's what it is. That's the anatomy of the upset, Pete. That's exactly it. It's not just one thing. It's it's the anxiety that athletes start to feel when they know they're supposed to win, when they know their team is better and it's not going their way and and they start pressing and it gets worse. Uh, And then you fake a punt and get fired two weeks later and get an extra seven point five million dollars that that'll. That that'll happen to you. Also it, it, the sometimes. pucker power happens on the sideline; just doesn't happen in the trenches. Oh man, hey, play it calling happens. pucker power. Uh, it happens. Set pucker power it happens uh-huh. big time. I mean, these guys, these guys know that they're they're coaching for their jobs. Sometimes, uh, you know, the last time we had college game day at Tennessee, um, we had a segment on the show about. I, I'm almost positive this was the same week. Auburn LSU game. Remember the Auburn LSU game where LSU threw a touchdown pass at the end. Uh, Danny Etling threw it, and it, it was less miles against Gus Malzahn. Complete clock mismanagement, right? right? Like he could have been arrested for misdemeanor. I mean, probably right. a felony on that one, if I remember Correct. right. Like they had no business winning, and then they just threw a touchdown on the last play and walked. No, out no, no. The, the, I know which game you're talking about. Okay. No, this that was a different LSU threw, Auburn. Yeah, different LSU game. Auburn game. It was in Auburn. LSU oh, in threw, threw a pass in the end zone, complete touchdown, hat celebrates, all good. Go back and look. Time expired. No play. Out of bounds. You know, then he yeah, gets fired. I, yeah, I, I think. I, if memory I, serves, I mean, you know, our our listeners will correct me if the details yes. are wrong. But they that was that was the game. That was a, a pucker power game because both coaches, we talked that morning on game day about the yeah. losing coach might get run. Yeah, you know? and so yes. you're right at the end of the game, and you come right, you come right to the end, and then and then touchdown overturn, and Auburn wins the game, and so all of a sudden, you know, the whole thing turns on one place. You can't tell me that when a coach is leading his team, that that's not somewhere in the recesses of his subconscious. It has to be, you know. There's no way, no yeah. way around it. Yeah, in in the lexicon of bizarre Les Miles things, winning the game, losing the game, and getting fired from both doing those. Fits right in his bizarre, bizarre trail through uh, through through all that. But yeah, so we, I am I am a firm believer in uh, in 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 pucker power. And you know, the longer you do this, and the more you talk to these coaches, and the more you kind of get to know them, and they like call on Friday nights and like let you know like exactly what they're thinking. You're like, oh yeah, you're nervous. <laughs> you can't show it to your team. You are nervous. Did you see the sideline clip on social media this weekend? from the uh, Rutgers Temple game. Oh, of it the of Shiano talking to Sean Gleason. No, I didn't. I didn't okay. see that. So there was uh one of the Rutgers beat writers put it out as a like lip reading challenge mm-hmm. and uh it was basically he was gently encouraging coach Gleason to control the game against Temple. Um 
in uh, you know ball ball control and such. But uh, his body language may not have shown that he was delivering that message with uh, you know g- gentle tones that I would use with baby Teddy. So it's uh, but it was a little bit like you you see in the moment like boy you know Temple's still hanging around in this thing. Let's let's go back to our plan. So I just thought it was a manifestation of a of a an interesting little window into what we're talking about. You know, Sean Gleason, another one of the guys uh, discovered by Mike Gundy, mm-hmm. brought in, elevated his career. Gundy has a long and storied history of that Oof. and also uh, a history of saying exactly what he thinks. You see what he said about the end of end of Bedlam and his comparison to uh, comparison to a couple having fights and wanting to turn the tables and blame it on the other one when clearly the one uh, only one party was at fault. Gundy uh, is is an expert at rallying the base, right? Yeah, he is. <laughs> and he that was that was red meat for the base, right? Yeah. Like let's just let's just you know it was probably gently truthful, right? <laughs> like 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 yeah, I mean there was there was some there it was the truth that the Oklahoma State fan wanted to believe, and he delivered uh, he delivered that to them. Uh, he's he is right about that about them leaving, and Oklahoma State had no say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but well, sure. nobody's yeah. stopping them from playing. Correct. Yeah, so you know that's so he's wrong about that. It's yeah. sort of like it's sort of like uh, you know I heard a wise man once say conflict delayed is conflict multiplied. So they're just mm. you know they're they're delaying the conflict. It's just going to escalate uh, escalate even more, and that's going to make for yeah. a very fun bedlam for however long however long we have it from this point forward. Yeah, well, thank God, you know, because the bickering between Texas and Texas A&M about scheduling the last decade was so great. We get to have the same bickering moved up north, like one contiguous state. So because, you know, every time like there's some opportunity, somebody's going to say something, it's going to be a big headline or every time they could possibly play in a bowl. Like that's just uh, and it's really in this realignment era, the most unfortunate part. The notion it is. of Oklahoma not playing Oklahoma State is completely preposterously ridiculous. It, all right. Like, like there's a, it is unthinkable and unforgivable that they are not going to play in football. And I get all the scheduling dynamics and this many games and this many, uh, whatever. Figure it out. Stop it. We, we put together an entire season in 2020, like in a few months. I mean, come on. You know, we can, they, they can play and they should play. I'm going to take a contrarian point of view on Texas, Texas AM, though. I'm glad right, they're going go. to play a game. And I called the last game that they played in College Station with uh, Pollock and Jesse Palmer. Wasn't it? And, didn't it come down to a field goal? Yeah, it did. Uh, A&M should have had the game in hand, and they didn't. And that happened Texas many won. times in that era for A&M. And Texas came down and came back and won the game. Still happens, Reese. <laughs> yeah, it still does. But, you know, in the ensuing years, and while A&M has delivered – varying levels of frustration to its fan base during its time in the sec not on signing day uh not on signing day (laughs) the one thing that a&m has proven decisively is that they don't need texas they don't need them they they proved that they went to the sec they don't need them they're their equal now and they don't they don't have there was a i think a perception through all of those years when they were in the southwest conference uh into the big 12 that you know, there was a hierarchy there and the Texas a and needed Texas. No, they don't. Now, are they better? Well, we, with need them? Them. we need them. We need them. That's what I was about <laughs> to say. Now, are they going to be better with them in the abs freaking lootly? You know, so it's going to be great to have that back. I don't see Oklahoma and Oklahoma State the same way. There, there's no way for Oklahoma State, Oklahoma State to prove that, you know, because they're the ones being left behind. It's a different dynamic. A&M was going to the stronger position in terms of conferences. Oklahoma State is not. Oklahoma State should play. They should do whatever it takes to play. And Oklahoma should accommodate that too, by the way. So hopefully, hopefully after a while, they'll just have the fight and get it over with and then play. Let's get the governor involved. We could have a whole like April and May of talking about this. But yeah. it's, like it is the kind of thing where politicians could start meddling. Um because remember, one of the reasons why the whole Pac-12 thing fell apart for Texas and Oklahoma was that Oklahoma State and Texas Tech had to go, and that gummed thing that gummed things up. Um, and that was what Syracuse didn't get in the ACC one of those first rounds because Virginia demanded Virginia Tech. Like mm-hmm. politics can come into play more often than we would we prefer no politics, right? Um, but politics can come into play in college sports, you know, and and have historically and significantly too. 
and so I just I just wonder if that game and what it means to that state um, it, in Oklahoma State's going to be fine. But I just, you know, we're in the entertainment business at the end of the day. We are all pawns from the holder to the head coach to the president who authorizes it all to the broadcasters and the man. Like it is a multi billion dollar entertainment business. And the entertainment business is exponentially worse without Oklahoma playing Oklahoma State, especially if you live in Oklahoma. Yeah, for sure. Well, the the other great college football philosopher, I referenced David Pollock on the show last week, but the greatest college football philosopher, Lee Corso, reminds us often, it's entertainment, sweetheart. Football's our vehicle. Yes. Right? Yes. He, remi- he reminds us of that on the show, uh, show very often. Notre Dame, North Carolina. Want to hit on this one quickly, not so much because of the game itself, but because of um, – the Drake May joke that that he made about uh, Carolina versus NC State. He made an off offhand comment, a joke that's as old as time itself. It's as old as uh, any college football rivalry. You joke that you know your school is academically superior. You know, so what? Big deal, right? I mean, every everybody does it, and and so then then Drake had to apologize. Uh, for for saying that you know NC State people were people that couldn't get into Carolina, as if Carolina uh, doesn't have enough things that they could provide fodder to NC State fans regarding their academics over the years. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's plenty there, right? And plenty. so yeah, so they could have fired right back and would have been willing to. He didn't mean it. It was it was just a an offhanded comment. It's a joke. Have we lost our sense of humor uh, to the degree that we can't even do that? And you you submitted that you thought that that was one of the more insincere apologies you'd ever seen when Drake said, you know, I've got to represent the university better, blah, blah, blah. I hope that he didn't mean a single word of that apology. <laughs> he, he shouldn't. So what? I mean, we've got to have a little bit of a sense of humor every now and then to take good natured jabs at people. You You don't think. You don't think Tennessee fans this weekend will be there? That you don't think there will be one sign in the crowd about jorts? <laughs> so let's recreate the scene in Mac Brown's office when he uh, has Drake May in <laughs> to give him the uh, to give him the lecture. Drake, Drake, Sh- <laughs> Shally and I talked at dinner last night. We, we didn't think we didn't think what you said about NC State was very nice. It's a, it's a very good school <laughs> over there in Raleigh. It's a very good school. Uh, he also knows NC State is pretty darn good, and they, uh, they could they could score seven thousand points on them this year. Now, look, Drake May's been a revelation. He's been he's fantastic. Been he's yeah. been really good. Um, yes, like uh, there's a line between being demeaning and harmless fun, and that to me fell in the harmless fun. Like it, that's agreed. the joke you text your buddies from high school. That's like the kind of razzing. I I like it's pretty hard to offend me. And I was, I was more offended that they made him apologize than me too. what he said. Like, that's just, uh, you know, yeah, to me, that was uh, there now, you know, obviously, you know, Mac knows exactly what he has as a team. And I'm glad like we didn't actually have to talk about that game because trying to figure out North Carolina and trying to pick their games the last three years. I mean, it is like a blindfolded, you know, p- pinata hitting. Like, it is like good luck at a, it's just, they, they are so spastic and so unpredictable. Um, and I do think their poor performances, especially defensively, ha- and in the potential of NC State coming into Chapel Hill, you know, a little bit ticked off at old Drake May probably had more to do with it than anything than anything he said. Yeah, and as if they're not going to get after them anyway. You know, I mean, they're, yeah. they're going after it. Drake May is QBR's uh, close to 90 and 11 touchdowns and one interception against a Notre With no Dame Josh team. Downs. Yeah, and, and Notre Dame team that's had trouble scoring. Uh, and he'll is, be back, by the way. Josh Downs will be back. This he'll, be, he'll be back Saturday? Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad you – I'm glad you gave me that little bit of information before before Friday because I, Drake May, um, yeah, he is he is the younger brother of their basketball star Luke May. I've been around Luke some from covering basketball. I actually met Drake's grandfather while he was being oh, cool. recruited at a speaking engagement. Just a you know a terrific family, and he's oh. uh, and uh, boy, he's he's been. He's been terrific. And that, that was one of the questions coming in is how good would Carolina be at quarterback? Because, you know, I, you, you being a Syracuse guy, 
last year with Sam Howell, even with the struggles that he had. Remember when Bayheim went off about what wasn't it Jerry McNamara that said he w- wouldn't have won 10 bleep yes. games? Yeah. Uh, that that was Sam Howell last year. I'm not sure oh, yeah. Carolina wins three games last year without him. So yeah. you know, he Drake completely May's carried them. Yeah. Do you think Drake May is uber, uber hardcore Carolina family? was like happy that he did that. You know what I mean? Like, son, oh, yeah. you shouldn't have done that. And then he hugs him and kisses him on the head. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even, I don't even know if they gave it the obligatory <laughs> son, you shouldn't have done that. You know, you know who I'll tell you a little secret here, Pete, that I'm sure, you know, you know, who probably laughed at that harder than anybody, even though, look, let, let's just go ahead and say, this is not the funniest joke that's ever been told. It's an yes. old joke. Everybody does. He said it as an aside. Drake doesn't even think it's the funniest joke that's ever been told. But I'll tell you who I bet laughed really hard at it, even though he's heard it a thousand times. Dadgum old Roy Williams. <laughs> because, because if you could do something to jab the wolf pack, old Roy's in. You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Drake May's been a revelation. Big challenge against Notre Dame this week. He's one of the best in the game. And best of the game is brought to you by Old Dominion Freightline, helping the world keep promises. So we'll see if Drake may can keep the promise of North Carolina beating Notre Dame this week, I, I'm leaning Tar Heels when we get to the pick, which means we should congratulate the Irish on their victory yeah. already. <laughs> First so, road win for Marcus Freeman already. So yeah, good, good for Marcus. That's awesome. Please be joined on the podcast now by the great Dan Mullen. Now working with us as a commentator, a lot of experience in the Florida Tennessee game, Dan, we've been uh, talking about, the uh, absurdity of having North Carolina quarterback Drake May apologize for an innocuous joke that he made. What's the funniest thing you ever said about Tennessee leading into the <laughs> Florida Tennessee game? <laughs> you know, I, I, I always felt pretty comfortable going into that game. Uh, I think we, uh, we went undefeated in that matchup. So I, I just kind of kept it very much to myself. I didn't need to stoke any fires or, or give give much of it more give them much of a chance when we played that game. So uh, I, I I always laid that pretty low, even though I always enjoy it because I do like all week leading into that game. All you play and you blast the entire <laughs> practice is Rocky Top, right? <laughs> and it's kind of a catchy tune. <laughs> you know, right? And the problem is, is after the game for about the next two weeks, all you do is sing Rocky Top in your head all day long. Do, do you know, do you know the lyrics to Rocky Top, Dan? Uh, I mean, all I know is like, hey, uh, Rocky Top, you'll always be home sweet home to me. Good old Rocky Top. And you got about 10,000 people going, woo! Yeah. Here, Rocky here. Top, Tennessee. Here, here are part of the lyrics. <laughs> Once I had a girl on Rocky Top, half bear, other half cat. Wild <laughs> as a mink, but sweet as soda pop. I still dream about that. So there you go. That, that's a little bit of a little lyric there to work into your repertoire when you get Rocky <laughs> Top stuck in your head this week. Let, let me ask you this, Dan. So you, I believe, uh, last year were the second longest tenured sec coach with with nick saban being the first so you've been to all these environments you've been there multiple times uh we're obviously going to knoxville with with game day uh they are they are thirsty there they are ready for their moment what separates playing in knoxville that fan base that environment from the other rabbit environments around the sec you know, I, I think they they're, the passion of them, they, they have not been on top or, or you know, even really uh, been in the mix uh, as a top program for quite a while. Uh, but every time you go in there, I mean, the stadium's packed. Uh, it's going to be deafening. I, I think it is. It's one of the most impressive stadiums in all of college football. Uh, and I go back. I, I remember going there as, as a grad assistant when I was at Notre Dame and you walk in. And I mean, it is, I mean, a, a cathedral of a stadium, 360 degrees around you. You look up at the press box and the press box goes is about a hundred yards long, um, you know, with, with several, all the stories high. And so, uh, you know, it, it is, it's impressive that the fan base is that passionate, you know, win or lose wherever they're at, they're going to show up and they're going to support the team and they're going to create a hostile environment for you. Any favorite moments of hostility? You know, 
again, I was always pretty successful. So they didn't want to, like, you know, I mean, it wasn't, they, they didn't have a lot of choice words. I always thought their fans were, 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 you know, fairly polite compared to some places. So who, who are the most impolite fans? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, you have to understand, I mean, it, during my time in the SEC, I, my least welcoming environment was probably <laughs> Oxford, Mississippi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I do remember going to recruit up there one day and going to a game, So, I, and I decided to take a helicopter into the game in Oxford. And they decided it was pretty necessary to make sure there were nine sheriffs around me at all times while I was <laughs> at the high school game. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mean, they didn't. They, they didn't do that. I mean, every time you go into, you know, when you go into to, to Death Valley and LSU, it's amazing that everyone tells you how you're number one the whole time in the ride in there, but they use a different finger to tell you. Like, I usually like, hey, we're number one. They, they have a different way of telling you you're number one um, when you're going in into in Death Valley. So that's always an interesting one. And they have a lot of choice things to say as the buses kind of pull in and they Luckily, they have a top now that they can't mm -hmm. as much throw things at you. So you have a little bit safer path into the stadium. What, what do you make of the difference in the Anthony Richardson that we saw against Utah and what you've seen the last couple of weeks and, and what, what that leads you to think about what you'll see Saturday against Tennessee? You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I think what you saw, it, what I saw anyway in the Utah game is – the guy that has the talent that, I mean, I know he, he has so much talent uh, and he just went out there and was playing, you know, as I mean, he started last year a little bit and, you know, was always banged up the entire season could not get healthy. So it was hard to get him on the field uh, consistently, but, you know, I think it was a guy that was relaxed and, you know, there was really no pressure. They weren't expected to win kind of almost the underdog at home. And he went out there and played. Um, and then the last two weeks, I think you saw a guy that now in, in, as a younger player is expecting to lead the team. You know, it's kind of this outside pressure. And, and it, it, it comes on younger players of saying there instead of, hey, relax, go play, make your reads, you know, hand the ball off, do different things. If you got a lane, you can run, relax and go make plays and just manage and run the offense. And I think you're seeing as a guy that feels, okay, I'm now this star. There's these expectations on me that I have to live up to. And you start pressing. And I think he's really been pressing. Uh, it's looked like to make the plays the last couple of weeks instead of letting the plays just come to him. Let me ask you this, Dan, as a, as a play caller. Uh, I've never called a play. I assume Reese has never called a play. And I'm always fascinated getting that insight because it's such a, such a key part of the game. Uh, Billy Napier said this week that their backup Jack Miller is out and uh, they're, you know, nobody wants to play their third string. And you ran your quarterback for years at most places. There were some years you didn't, but I would say more yeah. often than not. So when you have a deficit in your quarterback room, how does that factor into your mind of whether or not you run the quarterback when you, 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 you would take a precipitous drop behind him? Well, I think, I think the issue comes, and a lot of times with that is the bigger hits you're going to see on quarterbacks a lot are going to be in the pocket. And I think if you come out and you go into somebody that's a, a great athlete, like an Anthony Richardson, right, where uh, obviously he has the arm strength, he has everything, but as a young player, he's very dangerous using his athletic ability, right? You have to account for him. And if you tell him, take that part of your game away, there's a psyche that goes into the quarterback in that mindset. So I, I don't, you know, I, I think, you know, and if, if, if coach Napier is coming out and you say it, then that's in the building and then it can get in your head sometimes. I think as a play caller, you have that in your back pocket, right? And you say, Hey, and you go in and say, Hey, listen, man, Hey, we got to win this game. This is a huge game. You got to go play. You got, we're going to do what you do well. And you make sure your quarter, the quarterback's very confident about that. Now you're cognizant as a play caller. I'm going to try to protect situations, but I don't want to let on that the players know that. What difference but, do you see? No, go ahead. I was going to say the other big thing as a play caller is, especially if you have to let the quarterback do what he does well to gain his confidence within the game. Right. And, you know, and, and every different quarterback is going to get started a different way. Like, I mean, if you had a, a, a Tim Tebow and you're playing a big game, 
I, I mean, I'm going to call quarterback power because he wants to hit somebody. That kind of gets him into the flow of the game, right? You know, if you have an Alex Smith, you're, I, we were always, hey, let's open the game with a nice little option route. He's going to kind of outmaneuver you and, and put the ball exactly where, where it needs to be. You want to kind of get the game going that they shake off the cobwebs, you know, in, in big games on the early so they're in their comfort zone. On the other side, uh, Josh Heupel has done just that with Hendon Hooker. He looks like a different guy from the guy that was at Virginia Tech. What What is it that Florida needs to do against this offense to slow them down? Because if they start running three plays a minute, um, th- this this might get out of hand pretty quickly. What What can Florida do to take away that pace from Tennessee and take away the productivity? Well, I mean, you have to, you always, when you're going to play those teams, you have to win on first down, right? Because I mean, the, the, the paces get going when they have a great first down play. If they go, if they're at second and 10, the pace can start to slow down a little bit, right? Because now second and 10, even if they're going, trying to go fast, they get a four or five yard play, they're third and five. And now you've slowed the pace, put the pace down a little bit. Uh, and you have to be really sound. And when you're playing Josh Heupel in that offense, they do a great job. They're going to stretch you horizontally to run the ball. And then they're going to stretch you vertically in the pass game. And they do a great job of that with their splits. And what I mean by that is they're going to you watch them. The wideouts are out really wide, okay, to try to isolate the people in the box to run the ball and create an explosive play. And you have to win your one-on-one battles to not allow that to happen with the front seven. Okay? And then as you kind of cheat everybody into the middle of the field, they're going to take their shots uh, down the field. And they have some explosive guys on the outside to do that. So, I mean, but the benefit I think that, that Florida is going to have is I think they might have a little bit better talent one-on-one on the outside to be able to run with Tennessee's receivers than the teams Tennessee's played so far. So Hooker's interesting to me, Dan, and obviously quarterback development is really like the billion dollar engine of this whole entertainment industry we're in. And the the curves of quarterback development uh, vary greatly. And could you maybe explain as someone who's developed a lot of quarterbacks in a lot of different styles and ways, why someone like Hendon Hooker might've been pedestrian at Virginia Tech and then has just accelerated so much. And not that you studied him at Tech, but like he's accelerated so much under Josh. Just, can you explain a little bit of this, the psyche of quarterback development? Because it's almost like a 50-50 prospect when you look at top 20 lists of guys over the years. And just walk us through a little of the insight of, of, of why somebody like that can develop late. I, I think one thing is, is a lot has to do, and it, it's not always system, but it is system. And I think you want to have the flexibility, you know, I, I've always found success to have flexibility in that our job as coaches is to put the quarterback in positions to do what they do well. Don't, don't try to force him into a system. And with a hand and hooker, it would seem to me he's now in a system that really fits him. You know, that offense really suits him and he's very comfortable. He's now also gained the experience. And there's a lot that comes with confidence at the quarterback position, right? You spend you spend so much time on them knowing what is going to happen on the field before it happens. Okay. And so it, 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 it a lot of the development comes from I know why we're running the place we do. When you your quarterbacks get to the why, right? And I know what to do. I know how to do it. I know why we do it. So he looks now, he's in a system, in, in the system where he throws a great deep ball, manages underneath, and then is, and can get the ball out quick into pressure, into, into slants, and, and the other things that they run in a system he's very comfortable with. And he now knows exactly where he's going with the ball. When, you, you know, I always say this with a quarterback, if you go watch quarterbacks and routes on air, say, hey, we're going to throw slants right now. They're going to be really good. Right. And because you know what, they know what they're doing. They have their footwork down. They're not thinking about anything else. They're doing that. I think you're looking now at a hand and hooker with experience within the system in one that he's does well, that Josh has put him in a position. He's very comfortable when that he knows where, Hey, I'm throwing this, I'm throwing a deep ball over here to the right right now. Okay. And if that ha- doesn't happen, this is my second option. And then my check down. And so he is very confident in fundamentals technique that back. And I mean, if it goes right, I already knew what I'm doing. And if it doesn't go right, 
I'm automatically to my second. I'm not thinking about it or processing it. I'm already there. And so once that's such a big thing with the quarterbacks of getting them to understand the system and then doing what they do well within your system. This program, Tennessee, I mean, it seems to me is at a crossroads moment, seminal moment. They've got to win some of these games. As you have developed programs over the years and you want to elevate and take that next step into the level of being a competitor and you come to one game, you don't want to make one game the be all end all. How would you describe the significance for Tennessee of needing to win this game? They're favored. Our FPI matchup thing gives them like an 87% chance to win. Florida's in the first year of a new coach. They don't have depth in the quarterback room. Tennessee's supposed to win this game. So how does that factor in? What does it do for them if they win? And what's the danger if they don't on Saturday? <laughs> the, 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 the danger is, is bigger if they don't, right? Because they haven't beaten Florida in, in very often in, in recent years. Okay. And it's, it's very much, you know, when you're trying, you're Tennessee right now, you're, you're in the Dr. Leo Marvin, right? Your baby steps as you want to build your program, right? <laughs> right? You know, if, if you know, Bob Wiley right there, you're baby stepping and you're baby stepping. And so right now, when you're looking at, you know, Tennessee and, and one thing, you know, they, they have to play Georgia and Alabama right now, every year, who are the, the top two teams in the SEC to build the program, the focus can't start on, how we're going to go beat Georgia and Alabama right now. The focus is okay, we're going to baby step right now. We're going to, we're going to take that step. Once we beat Florida, boy, that's a step right now that we've shown that we can go do that. Okay. And then we're going to baby step and we got to go beat uh, Kentucky. Right. And, and we kind of keep baby stepping our way through until all of a sudden you realize we have six wins in conference. Now the focus has got to shift to the Alabama, Georgia to take that next step. Mark Stoops is a great example of that, of, you know, a program. I, that was a big one. I think they did it when I was at Mississippi state is saying, Hey, okay, let's see, let's first, how do we get to six wins to get to a bowl game? Okay. Then let's go. And who are we going to pick off next? You know, we're going to, we're going to pick off Arkansas. Then we're going to pick off Texas a Then we're going to pick off Auburn, you know, and then we're going to try to build up. We, ne we never got to Alabama. Uh, in all those years, which not many people have, but you start picking them up and those six wins start to go to nine, start to go to 10, and then you start competing for titles that way. And I think this is a huge game and a baby step for them to get over that next hurdle. You, you mentioned that in the steps, Dan, uh, you obviously saw Georgia up close in uh, Jacksonville for uh, your tenure at Florida how big of a step do you, we have a small sample size, but how big of a step do you think have they've taken? And can you, can you quantify how impressive it is after losing 17 draft picks that they have played at this high of a plane and really not uh, taken any steps back? Yeah, I think the, the thing that, that they are doing, and, and I think Kirk Kirby's done a very good job of being very flexible. Okay. I know a couple of years ago we went in and we scored a ton of points on them, created matchups, and, and, and um, he went and they changed a lot of their defense after that. I think, you know, it was kind of like, hey, they, 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 they showed a little weak spot within our scheme and we're going to go change. Now, they have, they have great talent too, but he wasn't afraid to kind of tweak and change the scheme. Uh, and I think if you look at last year's team where, hey, they were going to sit there and say, we're good scoring 24 points because you're not going to get that on us, you know, and, and now they would end up scoring more than that, but that wasn't kind of how they were approaching the game. Um, you know, I think it was in, in our game last year in Jackson was like three, nothing with a minute left in the first half. And it was going to be this kind of drag it up battle. And we throw, you know, two, two pick sixes in the last minute of the, of the half and it, and it opens the game up. But again, they were so defensive based. I think he's done a great job of letting them go offensively for a defensive coach. And it, it's, it's not easy, which is saying, Hey, we might put our defense in a little bit tougher situations because we're going to be aggressive offensively, but that also there's a flip side to it, which is he has a, a lot of these guys on defense played last year. They have a lot of talented players. And if we can use our explosive offense, which is now a strength of ours, our defense gets to play with a lead. 
People are now looking at us and saying, hey, we're not going to be able to just grind this out and try to win it in the fourth quarter. We might have to try to score with them. And that allows their defense to make even bigger plays. And so I think they could be better this year, even better this year than they were last year, because they're still because you're going into that game saying we got to maybe score 40. And that's tough duty. You're going to be against that defense and you're going to press to try to score and you're going to let that defense take advantage of you pressing, trying to score. Taylor, do we have a direct line to our, of our podcast into the Georgia football building? Because literally while we're talking about this, I got a text from someone unnamed saying, slow down, pump the brakes on Georgia. We've got this issue. We got that problem. I mean, I just said that there's some separation from what I've seen in the first three weeks from Georgia and even Ohio State and Alabama. I think there's some separation there. They played better. Doesn't mean I, they're going I, to all I, year, but they're like, pump the brakes, slow down. We've got all kinds of problems. Yeah, I haven't seen them yet. They're putting the mouse traps up in the building, right? Yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> They they have a veteran quarterback and they have great skill players. And, you know, when you have those things, you have, there's a lot of leadership and things that come with that on the offensive side of the ball. And, you know, I, I, the interesting one for me, as you said, and and I would throw, and it's interesting because they haven't really been tested, but I'd throw Michigan in that group with those teams over the first couple of weeks, because they look different to me and that they have guys now that can score. Right. And the biggest one, you, you need guys, you, when you get in these big games, you're not going to be going on 14 play drives consistently up and down the field. At some point, someone's got to score touchdowns. And Michigan now looks to me like they have some guys that can score touchdowns. The interesting one is I think there's those four and then there's a drop off, but those four all have to play each other. So it's going to be really interesting of, of who else gets in the mix as the year goes on. I, I tell you, I think I agree with you on Michigan. Michigan might have a little bit more of a test this weekend than than you would suppose because they're facing somebody that can score. They have, they have players in Maryland who can hit you for explosive plays and put touchdowns on the board quickly. Got a freshman running back in Roman Hemby who's uh, he's averaging more than nine yards a carry. Uh, well, Michigan's a better team, and Michigan should win. They'll probably win handily. But to your point, Dan, another one, of, another one of those teams that can hit you with a big play and kind of make the game uh, turn in a different direction a little quicker than you might anticipate. Yeah, they, they're, they're exciting because their quarterback can get it. They have playmakers on the perimeter. And when you have guys that can score, you're, you're always going to be in the mix because you can put pressure on people. And I think that helps. But I do think we'll learn more about Michigan this week and you know, I, I, I like how their schedule really lined up when you look at it. You know, I, it, it's hard to look at that schedule, you know, after even you always thought the trip to Iowa was going to be a real tough one. But, you know, I mean, but Iowa has not been able to, you know, they to score a point almost. You know, it's, it's been a struggle. And when you look at their schedule, it's very easy to see they're, they, that they're going to go to Columbus undefeated. And they took that baby step last year. So they're going to have a little bit of confidence with that. And you'd think Ohio State has a little bit tougher road. But they, if those two could possibly be undefeated going into that game. And, and what does a loss to each other do to that match, the, to the to people at that point? Yeah. And I, I don't know if I said it for sure. Michigan's playing Maryland. I, yes. Just, uh, I don't know if I pointed out exactly exactly who they're playing do you, do you like do it you like doing this dan you don't have you know, a lot of, a lot of you guys that come over from uh come over from coaching to the dark side of broadcast you you get the itch you get the fever pretty fast here how how are you doing in that regard i'm doing pretty good because you know what what i what i you realize is there's a lot of things in life you miss as a coach or um that, that you don't get to do. I've got to go watch my son play football. You know, it was his first year playing. I get to go watch him play, um, you know, drive my kids to school, pick them up from school, be around family activities. Uh, you know, Megan and I have a tea time today, you know, so we get out and play some golf. And uh, now I, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, there's things you miss, you know, I mean, about it. And, you know, you miss getting in and some breaking down the film and the X's and O's. You miss the camaraderie you know, of, of the coaching staff camaraderie, being around in the team camaraderie, being in a locker room and around the players and those things. 
Uh, but you've also get, I've gotten to see a lot of a different side of life that I'm really enjoying as well. And I'm getting to kind of hang out and talk football with, with you guys and, and on Saturdays and, and, and do some fun things that way. So uh, I'm not going to rush back into it. I'm going to see, uh, see if, if this, uh, if this media side of the dark side, right from the coast, <laughs> if, if this fits my, fits me in, uh, in how I do it. Well, you're so killing it, Pete. He came, Megan, he came uh, and joined us. I mean, he, he came and joined us when he was coaching at Florida, Pete. Mm -hmm. Rolled up. Team meeting had gone a little bit longer than he anticipated. Rolled up, walked onto the set, did a tape blind uh, with Herb Street, an exo tape. Absolutely crushed it. I remember thinking, whenever he decides that he doesn't want to coach anymore, uh, that dude that dude will be gold on television. He has been so far, so... Well, he's got a secret weapon, Reese. Megan was a TV journalist for years. I know she worked at local news, I want to say, somewhere in the Midwest, Salt Lake City, and then she worked at the Golf Channel. Uh, I remember your first swing through Gainesville. How much coaching do you get from her, Dan, uh, I get, on your TV? I get, I get critiques, you know, like you, <laughs> you, you guys get hot updates of what's going on in the Georgia program right now. I get it. Boy, your hand's in the wrong place. You didn't look into the camera the right way. What are you sitting up straight? Adjust this. <laughs> it's makeup and in in a couple minutes what's going on like, uh, <laughs> you get tie knot criticism i get a lot of tie knot criticism you know I, well, I mean listen i try to take pictures and say like um, do i look appropriate right now am i good to go you know so it's uh but it no it's it's uh it's been a lot of fun and it's but it is great i i do think you know i think people don't look at in the coaching profession is it's 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 not just a job, it's a way of life. And it's not a way of life for you. It's a way of life for your entire family. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it, it, and, it, 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 and it's hard on everybody, you know, it, and all the pressures that come with it make it tough. And, and so it's been nice to enjoy family time. I want to say week zero, I was flipping channels and saw you like amid a rain delay for like 48 minutes. Was it zero or one? I, it I was week remember. zero. It's like my, week zero, my yeah. first, my first day doing raps and being on set on, on ESPN, they come in and we have about a two hour rain delay where they're like, Hey, you got there. Everyone's in there. Like, well, well, welcome to the TV side of things right there. Your, your halftime just turned into two hours, man. <laughs> those I loved those maybe because I like to run my mouth or something. I was in the studio for like, I think like 17 years. And I, I remember there was a, an obscure bowl game and there was a giant power outage. It was on the West coast and they came in and told Mark may, and it might've, I think that might've been Trev Alberts. I think that might've been before Lou said, you guys are filling until they fix the power. And we were on, we were on for hours until they finally got a generator and got lights on in the stadium or something. It was fun. To, it was my first day. I'm like, Hey, this is great. I get to be on TV. This is what I wanted to do. I'm on TV. Everybody else is like, right. What are we going to come up with next? What else can we talk about? I'm like, Oh, this is fun. So uh, they, they said, give it a couple years right now in the rain delay. And you'll be like, Ooh. It's a little <laughs> Hey Dan, thanks for being with us. Uh, do you, do you have a, a stone cold lock pick that you'd like to make before we let you go for this week, boy. Um, I was looking at it. There, there's Good some Lord, tough man. ones this week um, out there. Let's give me the toughest one, and I'll give it to you. Okay, we were talking about the Pac-12 road test with Oregon going to Wazoo, SC going to Corvallis to take on Oregon State. Uh, we've hit that. Uh, I'm going to go. I will say this. I thought the Pac-12 picked themselves off the mat after week one last week mm -hmm. um, and really showed something. And, and I think – Oregon showed that, that they were a little different team maybe than played week one. Um, and I, I was really impressed with the kind of the spirit that Washington had. I, I think those guys are going to keep rolling. Uh, and I think SC, you know, they, they did, they went to the transfer portal and recruited, you know, kind of a roster. They went and got the quarterback. He went and got some wide receivers with them. And they are, you know, they're, they're SC. They're always, they're, they're still good. Even though they're struggling, you're still going to look at them when they come out of the tunnel and they're still going to have some talent on that roster previously. And, and I think they're, they're going to have a shot to put a pretty good role together. The question is going to be, can they handle the adversity of success as the season goes on or is someone going to come up and bite them? But I don't think it'll be this week. All right. 
I don't know. Pete, Pete's raising an eyebrow. Pete is dying to no, pick no, beeves. I've, and so am I, yeah, to be I, honest. I pick At least take the point. I do. It's like six and a half, though. That's yeah. like, yeah. You wish you had just a little bit more. You wish you had a little yeah. over a touchdown. Little bit. Because <laughs> it could be, it, like, if it's 24, like, you know what I mean? Like, if the Beavers win, they're going to win by one on a field goal at the end. Yeah. Right. If USC wins, they could win by seven, but they could also win by 27. And yeah. there's, the, there's the seven that just gets you at six and a half. Yes. Yeah. Really it's always, exactly. uh, as Blues Traveler once said, it's the hook that brings you back, right? <laughs> and it's amazing as you watch the game, though, how much those guys know because you're watching a game and you're like, it's uh, SC's up yeah. big, and then Oregon State comes back, and like, what was? And you're looking, what was the spread yeah. on this? What's going on? It's always how do they know? <laughs> how how do they know at the end? Hey Dan, enjoy. We're enjoying your work, man. Keep it up. I look forward to talking with you more throughout the season. Thanks, you guys. Have a great day. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, the great Dan Mullen, and that's going to do it for this Wednesday edition of the College Game Day Podcast. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.